Also today, Jonathan Newby on climate change and why it's okay for scientists to cry. Well, scientists are not meant to cry, but the crying scientist is not that rare, especially if you're asking them about climate change. It happened to science reporter Jonica Newby when she interviewed the American snow scientist, Dr Jim White. Suddenly, he was in tears. It happened again when she talked to a young coral scientist about the Great Barrier Reef and what he was in the process of discovering. As it happened, she had her own tears to deal with, not only about climate change, but also the precarious health of her longtime partner, the science show broadcaster Robin Williams. Jonica Newby has a new book out. It's called Beyond Climate Grief, and she's here in the studio. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can we start with with Robin, uh, <sighs> if yes. only because we know him so well? <laughs> uh, you describe the moment. You're down at Jaroa, mm. uh, South Coast, and he he falls unconscious right in front of you. Yes, well, I was actually out on the deck reading a book and it was unusual that I was even home at that hour because normally I'm out surfing, but I was home and I hear this thump inside and I keep reading and I go, oh, something in my head just went, I'd better go check that thump. And I open the door and there is my partner, Robin Williams, lying on the floor, white, 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 like white. And his uh, his face, his mouth was open and he was doing that gaping sort of fish motion, which is not breathing. It's called agonal breathing. And all these thoughts were kind of going through my head. I could see the flowers out the back. It was a beautiful day as I was rushing toward him and thinking, this is the moment he dies. This is the moment he's dead. And I couldn't find a pulse. I couldn't find a pulse. Um, I was remembering things that Norman Swan had said, of all things. You know, I hadn't done CPR since I was uh, 10 years old in swim class. And, and then I remembered something Norman had said. And didn't, thinking, Norman, didn't Norman save him once? <laughs> <laughs> he did. And I knew that story. And that actually was running through my head as well. Uh, so after I figured about three minutes had gone by and I'm looking down at one of the smartest brains in the planet and I knew that um, that uh, brain damage would come in if you go to about four minutes and I just started pumping and I just didn't think it would work, of course. And But what else do you do? And I pressed one, two, three four, five, six, and this pink line went all the way up his body and his face and he woke up and looked at me and said, why are you crying? And I said, I just need a minute. And I rolled him into the coma position just to keep him quiet. He didn't, he didn't understand you'd saved his life. He did not. He said, he got up and said, I just, you know, I've, I've, I've just fainted. You know, I stood up too fast. Uh, and, you know, it, it was very traumatic for me, but he was in complete denial. And in fact, it took uh, an hour and I had to ring his cancer ward nurse to even get him to agree to go to the hospital. And, and I think that what had happened is that he was in severe de dehydration because of the chemo and that had uh, caused a bit of a heart block. Mm. Now, the reason this story, this very dramatic yeah. story, has a place in this book about climate change is that, is that Robin, who's number one in these people who deny it are idiots... Yeah. Was his, his own state of denial. denial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I could see the parallels between our denial that anything really bad could happen with the climate and our denial of our own deaths. And that actually became one of the one of the chapters later in the book as well. Uh, because you know, we, we evolved to deny our own deaths because otherwise we'd never get out of the cave, Richard. You know, we'd never go and, and, and risk all these terrible things that could happen in a day. And, and some people are more optimistic of their own survival and some are more threat aware. You know, we have personality differences on where the borderline of our denial is. And it fascinated me that dear old Robin, who hates climate deniers, is still in complete denial about the possibility of his own death, <laughs> even having done it a few times. Well, the world just couldn't exist without him. We all, we all know that. That show's, exactly. got to, that show's got to be there at the same <laughs> at the same time. It is interesting when you say about, you know, we'd never leave mm. the cave because that's a fear response. Mm. And there's plenty of reasons to have a fear response when you look at the data around climate change. I don't know that it's the most healthy response or, or, the, or the most likely to achieve anything. 
That's right. Um, and I felt that right from the beginning. So this is a book about emotions. It's not about what to do. It's about how we feel and how to process that. And uh, and one of the things I was thinking about early on is, is from a neurobiological point of view, how limited fear is. It's so important. Um, and we need fear to, to make us avoid threats. But the trouble is it's designed to spike and drop, spike and drop. And then you go, you look at the next problem and the next fear problem, and you don't go and look back at the long-term threats. It's for the occasional lion, right? Yeah, it's, that's right. It's for li- uh, running away from the lion. Um, whereas, so th- But if you look at the emotions that were designed to last in us, there's one really powerful one, and it's a cliche, but it's so true, and that is love. And, of course, love... Uh, is designed to be with us for the long term. Love, from a biological point of view, makes us bond to our kids and our partners and, and our beautiful heart places, I call them, you know, the landscapes that we love. And that love is there long term to make us protect what we love. Yeah. It's a long-term and emotion. And this is your challenge to readers, mm. is to say in your response to, to climate change, in, in your anger about it, your rage mm. about it, also use this love for whatever the place is for you to protect it, that protectiveness you might feel towards a child. You can also feel towards that bit of uh, landscape that you that you really love. In your case, it's the snow country, isn't it? That's right. So I've, I've come to call these places heart places and we all have them. And we fall in love with different places like we fall in love with different people. But it's a very similar biology. And I fell in, the love, in love with the snow before I even met the snow. You know, I grew up in Perth, about as far from the mountains as you could get. And uh, But I was reading fairy stories, you know. I was imagining dragons and, and thrilling peaks and sleigh bells and the possibility of magic. That's what snow means to us. It's part of our imaginative world. And when I moved across and joined Catalyst, moved across the eastern states, I got to fall in love with a real snow country, Kunamanamaji, the snowy mountains. And it was it remained, though, kind of a fantasy place for me. And, and Richard, I didn't tell people this in the book, but I used to actually put on the Lord of the Rings soundtrack on my way to the snow each time just to get my head out of the science world and into fantasy world when I went to visit the snow. But I had this moment um, and I'd always understood uh, climate change intellectually, but I didn't understand it emotionally until this moment. So there I was, 2017, I was having my first ever holiday in Japan skiing. It was fantastic. I was skiing powder. I was going to onsens. I was hanging out with Swiss ski instructors on holidays. And then I just said, oh, hang on a minute. What's a Swiss ski instructor doing here on holidays? It's January. This should be his busiest time of year. And Axel said to me, I wanted to get some good snow. And it turned out that Switzerland had had a green Christmas that year. And uh, later that same week, while still in shock, I was still in shock, half the Great Barrier Reef died and I suddenly looked around at this magical fantasy kingdom of mine and thought, oh, my goodness, climate change could hit here too. And I researched that for a year. I became obsessed by it and by the end of which I plummeted into climate grief. Yeah, yeah. And, and and quite a depression. There's even yes. a point where you go to see the GP and say, you, you've got to give me some pills for this because... Yeah, because I can't cope. The 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 just to stay with the snow for a mm. while. There's data about this. the The ski season in the US is now 35 days shorter than it was in the 1980s. You'd meet a a, a, a climate scientist who says you you say, well, at least we'll be able to ski above mm. 2,000 meters. We'll be able to ski. Mm. He says, no, no, no. By 20 uh, 2100, 70 percent of the snow, even above 2,000 meters, will be gone. Yeah, that's in that's in the Alps in Europe, you know, the home of the handsome ski instructor and, and all the culture we associate with uh, with mountains and Heidi and all that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I, if we don't turn around track, if we uh, if we actually continue along the same lines as um, as we are, 
then, yeah, we're looking at coral and snow. It's, it's a bit like killing Tinkerbell, for goodness sake. It's like trying to kill off the magical things. But I want to point out that's only the first chapter in the book. That's, that's the only really bad truth bomb in there. The rest is about mm. then trying to deal okay, with that it's knowledge. A, it's, it's a big truth bomb, yeah. though, because, of course, this is not just about skiing and, and postcards mm. and uh, glue vine in, in the chalet. <laughs> uh, the, the way that snow locks up water mm. is incredibly important, mm. both for maintaining water flows in things like American rivers yeah. during the summer months, but also for stopping massive flows, flooding flows of water out of in, in a different season. That's right. Uh, and a lot of the droughts in, um, in California in recent years have been low snowfall years because it's like having a massive Hoover Dam 50 times over. The snow locks up the water and then gradually lets it out um, to provide all the agriculture and drinking water for the, for the west coast of the U.S., and uh, so we need snow. We, d- we don't just love it. We need it. Okay, why snow matters. Jonathan Newby, Beyond Climate Grief is, is the book. You talk about the snow and you talk about the, the reef. And in both those cases, you talk to a scientist, a different scientist, who cry. Yeah. And they're both kind of, uh, well, you're a bit taken aback by it because scientists are not meant to cry. Exactly, uh, because when they contemplate this, uh, mind you, I was crying too, so <laughs> fair warning, because I did have about a year of climate grief where I just cried a lot. I, I think I'm through it now. But look, when I interviewed Missy Higgins, she got teary. When I interviewed Charlie Pickering, he got teary. It's like there's this great big well of emotion out there that hasn't really had a place to go. It's kind of been talked about as climate anxiety or, or you know, um, anger and so on. But what about all of us that actually, we don't even have a name for it, but I want to give it a name. It's climate grief. And, you know, once you kind of get that it's grief, uh, it gives it a space Mm-mm. to exist. Okay, but that might not be the best position from which to achieve change. Maybe climate courage is the better Absolutely. place. Absolutely. And, yes, I don't want to dwell in the negatives because most of the stories in the book are incredibly affirming and beautiful and surprising. Uh, so there's a chapter called Courage. So each chapter is told through the prism of a different emotion. And I should say this ended up being a full-on memoir because I was writing this in October 2019. So instead of being all these separate chapters, it's actually quite a gripping story because uh, my mum lives in Malakuta, so I kind of went to that uh, that place. But anyway, Courage, yes, I tell the story of uh, my grandfather's war and his Spitfire pilot um, ex- escapades, escape from the Nazis and so on. Because when you don't know how things are going to turn out and things look bleak, what do you fall back on when your hope is kind of feeling a little bit tentative at times? Well, fall back on courage. Old-fashioned, but I think it's really, really important. You, you, oh, you, that'll be the phone. That'll be the phone. You, you, actually, let me put this on. This is Missy Higgins. Me, like there's no need to be scared Like we never needed our bodies Like we have a life to spare Jonica Newby's here talking about Beyond Climate Grief. We'll talk about Missy. Uh, in in a in a moment, but talking about courage, your mum needed a lot of courage, didn't you? Didn't she? She's so she's in Malakuta on that terrible day when it all starts. Yeah, that was my mum calling. <laughs> she must have gone. You're on the radio. Did you know? <laughs> yeah, I am, mum. <laughs> so obviously she survived the horror. Uh, yeah, mum lives in Malakuta, and um, I didn't actually want to be writing the extra chapters that ended up in the book. But events, as you know, became so apocalyptic, we felt like we'd actually fallen into a film or a novel. And there's a lot of resonances with Lord of the Rings there, mm-hmm. um, which uh, which are in the book. But on that day in Malakuta, yeah, mum actually got out just in time. But I spoke to well, she she was sort of a climate refugee and we're, obviously we were all in touch with the people there, but we thought her house was definitely going to go. It became Schrodinger's cat house. You know, we didn't know whether it was alive or dead. But there's the most incredibly vivid and, and life-affirming uh, first-person accounts of what it was like to be there. And I think the one that struck a lot of people is what I call Nick and the Disaster Movie Dash. So, you know, this is a 30-year-old guy. He wasn't RFS. He just stayed to defend with a bit of briefing from his father-in-law. And he ends up 
the, the power lines fall down at one stage. Don't forget, it's it's pitch black almost. There's smoke everywhere. It's it's sort of a red of a red light and this fire everywhere. And he pedals his bike. He has to get out. He pedals his bike down this corridor of fire and then gets to the burning stairs and he runs down the burning stairs and 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 then the beach is on fire and then he has to run this way and he does this huge great big loop and then he keeps fighting the fire when when things if anything are, are, are even worse. I mean everyone on that day showed so much courage. Everyone over the whole summer showed so much courage and it was just them doing the right human thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's essentially what what I just uh, yeah, I just hope we don't forget the lessons of that summer because right at the end yeah. of it or in the middle of it, we all kind of knew, we all knew what it meant and we saw the courage mm. and, and then, you know, the, there's, there's a tendency for, because some parts of the, not all, but some parts of the bush recover and mm. some human communities start to recover and there's a tendency to say, oh, well, this is the brave Australia, but the brave Australia also has to be an Australia which stares this down and, and understands that things have got to change. That's right. Well, in the conversation with Missy Higgins, which is an absolutely gorgeous conversation, uh, we actually come up with the term staring at the beast because you actually have to engage with the reality or you're just in denial. But then how do you stop that overwhelming you? And that's what the personal journey of the book was about. And there's a whole lot of fantastic strategies from some amazing psychologists that I met along the way. And, uh, and of course, you know, there's a bit of fun because we've got to have a, a laugh as well to stare at the beast. I mean, one of the really interesting things is that black humour really comes to the fore when when the shite hits yeah, the yeah. fan it is and people need it. Almost mm. every interview you say, is there a joke that goes yeah. with this? And and you meet a, a young woman, for instance, who's from a family, uh, she's a teenager, mm. but her her, uh, her the family house has, has been burnt down and even she and among her girlfriends, they're, they're swapping these black jokes about the, the ashen houses. Yeah, and there's a whole chapter called Humour and I think it was so um, vivid during that time of extremists that uh, how important laughter is and, and I have a little digression talking about why it evolved and it evolved to kind of defrag our uh, physiology. Um, Charlie Pickering, what did he say? He said something like, uh, humour is there to make the world feel okay and, and that's actually what it does at a biological level but it also has all these bonding hormones. So you feel safe and bonded and you need to joke about that terrible thing that just happened. You'll cry sometimes too, but you need to joke. Yeah. Well, uh, Jeremy, on the text, I've been to three climate strikes with my kids and mm. I cry every time. Yeah. So it's not only the science. <laughs> it's emotional. Yeah. Crying. Hey, uh, Jonica, congratulations on the book and thanks very much for coming in. Thank you so much. Jonica Newby's book is called Beyond Climate Grief. She's uh, speaking about it tomorrow night at Roaring Stories in Balmain and then Wednesday at Glee Books. So check out their websites to find out.